So one common approach to regulation after there has been a bank panic, like it was the case in 2007, is, well, we need to regulate more, right? We need to regulate more. Why? Because here are our goals. We want to make sure banks have the least risky stuff on their balance sheet. And there is financial stability. How do we measure financial stability? Well, we are going to look at banks. We understand banks. We're going to look at banks. We are going to see what they keep on their books. And as long as that's reasonable, not that risky, we are in good space. That's what we did in 2007. And the question to ask is, are these rules going to be manipulation proof? What do I mean by manipulation proof? There are always loopholes. And if you're not going to take a holistic view, you'll leave some loopholes, and that's exactly where all the risk will go. And you will just be surprised every time as if this was a shock, and it's not. A lot of that has to do with political economy. I'll give you one example. And also the fact that in banking and in general, markets and governance hasn't done that well. Okay? So let me sort of show you some more challenges. Let's first talk about manipulation proof rules. Aftermath of the Great Recession, more regulation. And I'm going to argue that, you know, what happened when we did more regulation, which means, hey, banks keep more capital, do this, do that, and so on, and we look at banks, we ended up with a more complex and intertwined system in ways that is worse than when we started, okay? In particular, there was a rise of shadow banking, and I'll explain what that is, and there were some good elements as well. There are fintechs and non-fintechs. Okay, so let me give you an example. Remember, in the 2007 uh, financial crisis, a lot of activity was in the mortgage market, so not surprisingly, we regulated pretty harshly on the mortgage sector. If you look at what is the share of mortgages that are in the banks and outside the banks, here is a picture, okay? This is telling you new originations any given year, where are they happening? Now, shadow banks, just so that all of us are clear, just means that you don't have deposits. Why? Because that's the line we have drawn as a regulator. That if you have deposits, you're a bank. If you don't have deposits, you're a shadow bank. We focus on banks. We regulate banks because that's where everything happens. And here is the market share of banks and shadow banks over time. So what, what have I plotted? In the US residential mortgage market, which is a $10 trillion market, by the way, yes, you can see this number. And this shows you by the end of 2017, the shadow bank share was around 60%. If you pull this number to 2019, we are talking about 70%, 75% of the activity in the mortgage market is in shadow banks. Okay? So what are shadow banks? What? Well, they don't have deposits. So if you wanted to understand who are we talking about, here is a snapshot from 2018. Look at the top 10 banks out there and shadow banks out there who are doing this activity. Number one, Quicken Loans. Okay? Uh, there are banks, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, uh, there is Bank of America, but there's a bunch of other lenders that you probably never heard of. They're all sort of in the space and doing a lot of activity. Now you might ask, hey, okay, what's the problem? There are some private players coming in, fantastic. Now it turns out that if you wanted to understand that this growth that happened, phenomenal growth from 20, 25% market share to 75% market share in a period of seven, eight years, how much of it is what? Turns out that in our research, we can sort of calculate that one third of this growth is driven by technology. The fact that there are these new lenders like Quicken, which make it easier, faster, quicker to originate mortgages. So right now, sitting on your computers, which is exactly what I'm sure you want to do right now, you could actually enter your name, address, and you could get a quote from Quicken Loans. Without uploading any documents, they would take care of that. So they are faster. They do things, that's a great thing. One third of this increase is happening because of that. So what are the sort of things that we sort of find? We find, for example, here is the time it takes when these lenders originate loans, they keep it on the books or sell, one indicator for how efficient they are is how quickly you're selling, because you need to get the documents, you need to get it verified, you need a notary, notary of a notary, and who knows what. And the two lines here is, one is a fintech shadow bank, the uh, maroon line, and the dotted line is a bank. And what's telling you is, hey, look, banks sort of take a month and a half, Quicken does it pretty fast. What it also does is, is you know, the qual quality that the consumers get is very, very high. And what is very interesting is that if you ask 
do they charge less or more, these fintech lenders actually charge higher interest rate. Okay, so here is the interest rate that they charge the borrower. Maroon is uh, uh, Quicken, and dotted line is a traditional bank. You can see maroon line is always higher than the dotted line. What does this mean? That I'm finding borrowers, and because I'm off offering convenience, borrowers are willing to pay for it. So this explains one third of the increase you see. Now, interestingly, remember that one way in which you can get market share is by lowering prices. They are getting market share despite higher interest rates. Okay? So the technology improvements that people perceive, the consumers perceive, is pretty high. So that's one element of this. But that's just one third. Two thirds of this we attribute to increased regulation. Capital requirements, more supervision, more documents, send this, send that, whatever have you. What have I plotted here? On the right hand side, what I have plotted is that if you can look at regions in the US, and we can classify based on data which regions have higher intensity of regulation, which regions have lower intensity of regulation. That's what we have done here. And on the y-axis, you can ask, OK, given that variation across regions, where is there more shadow bank entry, and where is there less shadow bank entry? And what I'm sort of just sort of plotting here is telling you that places where there is more regulation to banks are places where shadow banks have gained market share. And we can attribute two-thirds of that increased market share to just this. Now, you might ask, OK, fine, there is regulation and there is fintech, and there's technology. What, so, but where is a complex and intertwined system? That's where you would not know had you not looked at the data. So here is the first thing. You need to ask, when Quicken is coming in, and when all these shadow banks, remember, 75% of the market shadow banks, what are they doing? What's their business model? Here is their business model. They originate the loans and sell it. Who are they selling to? Here is the data. The key place to look at is in the middle. The maroon portion. What is that? GSEs, government sponsored entities, which are on basically government's balance sheet. Taxpayer based entities, because we bailed them out before. And what is this showing you? That basically 90% of their loans end up with GSEs. So shadow banks have come in, they have replaced banks. We have done a great job. If you look at banks, yes, banks have become smaller in the mortgages. Great victory. But where is the risk? Risk is sitting with government-sponsored entities. That's not what we intended, but that's what has happened. What's the other thing? So this is, the risk is in the wrong place. We didn't want the risk to be there because we didn't want GSEs to operate in the market to begin with because we thought that that was a bad thing. Second thing is, who is funding them? So they are selling their risk to GSEs. That's one thing. Who is funding them? Turns out, banks are funding them. Okay, here is the balance sheet of a shadow bank. Remember, shadow banks have no deposits. So who's funding them? 75% of their funding is coming from banks. And banks are giving them short-term loans. What's the problem with this? If there is any problem with shadow banks, who bears the risk? Banks. And if they sell these mortgages, who bears the risk? GSEs, taxpayers. So all the risk basically is sitting in the system. It's back with the banks or with the taxpayers. You decide who you want but we haven't made the system really better. So we did a bunch of things, but because there are loopholes everywhere, you end up with a system that is not that fantastic. Why do, we, why do I think that we end up with such a system? I think a lot of it has to do with political economy. When we are designing these rules, there's a lot of push and pull, and you know, this really affects how we want to think about uh, what is possible, what is sensible, what is not sensible. Let me give you one example, okay? Here is how pricing is done in the mortgage market. Okay, what do I mean by pricing? So think about Palo Alto and think about Detroit. Okay, everything else the same, it's pretty obvious that Detroit economic conditions are bad, it's a risky place, so the interest rates that are sort of given to loans should be higher in Detroit than Palo Alto. Okay, what have I plotted here? On the left-hand side, numbers are not important, but on the left-hand side here is what GSEs are doing, government-sponsored entities. Remember, chunk of the market is with them. And what is being plotted, what I have plotted here, each dot represents, given a level of risk, does the interest rate respond to that risk or not? And essentially, all I'm trying to tell you here on the left-hand side is that the contracts 
that are made in this market that is government-sponsored entities do not react to risk. On the right-hand side is the private market, which is a little bit of this market. And what do you see there? Of course, in a market, if there is risk, your interest rates need to respond to that. That's the most sensible thing to do. But yet, most of our market is operating in this fashion, where there is no consideration for risk. If there's no consideration for risk, markets cannot work. And then we can't blame the markets, because the rules have been set by government-sponsored entities, obviously because of political pressure. And there are many, many other examples as well. But because I'm running out of time, let me sort of uh, say one thing before concluding. Now, typically, when we talk about bank regulation, you know, we sort of completely absolve ourselves from markets and governance. Traditionally, we have always sort of maintained that, look, markets are there. There is labor markets. There are product markets. If you do not do the right thing, like what? Like take too much risk or do something really bad, you know, markets will punish you. How will markets punish me? Well, they'll not buy my product. You won't get a job if you're a manager and you did something bad and so on or no one will give you funding. But yet, time and again in the financial sector, what one finds is, for various reasons, the memory of the markets are pretty short, which makes the governance in this market very difficult. Now, part of this could be because there is so much government intervention that markets don't have a space to work. But let me give you an example. Here on the left, if you looked at during the Great Recession, how much misrepresentation or fraud was done by banks, you know, you might have seen many, many lawsuits out there. What I plotted here is on one dimension where they said, hey, look, I'm making loans to Jacob. And but turned out they were not making loans to Jacob. There was no Jacob there. And if you plotted how many of them lied, here is what this is telling you. And it's telling you everyone was doing it. Now, why is everyone doing it? One reason is whoever is doing it, if you see, there is no punishment in the labor market. What do I mean by that? They can go out and get jobs very, very quickly. In another study with financial advisors, where they do a lot of bad stuff, we found that if you looked outside and asked the question, hey, if you do misconduct and if you don't do misconduct, who hires you and how quickly do they hire you? So what do we find? If you, if you don't do any misconduct, 20% of the people leave a firm in any given year in the financial sector anyway. That seems reasonable. If you do misconduct, firms fire you more, so half the people are fired. But if you see what happens when people leave the firm, they find the job very quickly, almost at the same rate as someone who did not have misconduct. What that means is markets are not doing what we think markets should do, which is that if you do bad stuff, you won't get a job, therefore you'll behave yourself. A part of it is we don't let markets function. I just showed you that with political economy, we don't let interest rates respond to risk. There are many, many similar examples all over the place. All right. So on that fantastic note, what have I tried to sort of tell you? That there are many things that matter which make implementation of regulation difficult. I focused on regulators, then I talked about some challenges. Writing manipulation proof rules is difficult, partly because of political economy and because there's so much government intervention, we can't rely on market signals really, and that makes it difficult. So what's the conclusion? My conclusion is that, look, if you are interested in banking and financial regulation, you first need to understand why do we need this. As I told you in the beginning, the goals for why there should be regulation are not well articulated, because only when you articulate them well can you design and enforce them. There are lots and lots of stories, but if you look at data, you can't just make a black or white statement that, oh, it's public interest and capture. That's too simplistic. When you think about rules, when you think about uh, 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 different models and things like that, there is a lot and a lot of complication. So what is the way forward? I told you that I'm going to end on an optimistic note. My optimistic note is that we've got to be honest with ourselves that we don't understand this, okay? Rather than just saying, oh, we'll tinker here, we'll put a Band-Aid there, we'll put a Band-Aid there. Let's be honest. This is a complicated scenario. We have tried for a century to do this. We haven't succeeded because we've just gone with ideology at various points of time. So what do we know? Very little. So what's the best way to regulate? Well, if we do want to do regulation, let's work in a way which is easiest to do. And that brings me back to the first slide. This is the simplest way to fix the problem if you're really worried about banks. You had banks still making loans. Remember 95.5? I'm just saying let's make it 65.35. Whatever number you like. Why? What does that do? Now I need a 35% shock 
to my loan portfolio or any other loans I make before I become bankrupt. That's a huge cushion. So rather than saying, hey, let's take a little bit of capital here or there, no, let's just do this. That's it. Okay, so that's my one slide lecture on banking regulation. The bank should be like this. So any questions, please. Sure. What are regulators supposed to do when these new entities, they, they go out of the bounds of what was previously regulated? For example, with fintechs, as you mentioned, fintechs, some people think, were created because they just want to get outside yeah. of what regulators can cover. Yeah. So I think uh, if the regulators are trying to catch where the risk is going, they'll always be behind the curve, right? Because the way, that's a great question, the way you sort of detect these things is by saying, hey, let's look at the data. Data, by its definition, is going to come with a lag. And then you're going to say, oh, there, let's plug that, let's plug that. I think the main issue is there is risk in the system. Who should bear the risk? We are not very good at monitoring the risk and then trying to figure out how we should plug it. So let's just go with something like this, which is easy. It's your money. You have 35% equity, your own retained earnings. So any bad things that are going to happen, you're going to bear the risk. As long as you know that and you can get this funding, things should be fine. Regulators are not going to be solving this problem. This is market solving the problem by just making sure that you have enough funding so that you have enough skin in the game, essentially. Okay? So I do not think regulators, given all the problems that I told you, can solve these things uh, as fast as we would like. Yeah? I've, uh, you know, people talk about it quite a bit, that if we do go to equity-based versus debt-based, there'll be problems of liquidity, the markets will collapse, and I need evidence, uh, and there is no evidence. So there is people shouting that liquidity will evaporate, and this will happen, and that will happen. Let's, let's see it. Question. Thank you for your talk. Uh, yeah. How do you explain the success, I mean, the, 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 the success of, the free, of the relatively free banking system in the 19th century in uh, Scotland and in C Canada? And um, uh, what's your thoughts on the, this is, I know that this is a very uh, controversial view, but it's put out by many um, e economic historians, like um, Murray Rothbard, who, argue, who argues that the, the fractional reserve banking system is what really caught, um, leads, is, 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 is one of the main reasons for the, um, um, the, the uh, yeah, for, uh, uh, for um, one, 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 one of the main reasons for uh, that for b b b bank run, why b bank runs occur. So I think I, I I tend to agree with why bank runs occur has to do with the fragility of the balance sheet, the fact that you don't have enough of a cushion. That's what prompts everything. Our approach was, oh look, the bank balance sheet is fragile, so let's put FDIC in charge. FDIC will make sure that people don't get worried. But now because we have a backstop, managers say, why do we care? They start taking risk, and then when say they start taking risk, and the government is so intricately involved, market signals don't work at all. Because right now, for example, can you tell whether the banks are regulated a lot, not regulated a lot, what's going on, what's not going on? It's really, really hard to sort of tell. So my view is that, look, there are lots and lots of these uh, 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 views out there, but uh, I would like to see some evidence. Uh, if you think that, look, liquidity is going to disappear, Absolutely, there is an argument to be made that that could happen. But unless we see this in the data, it's hard to sort of make any debate about it because you could say there could be liquidity issues, you could say fractional is the reason behind it. I don't know. You could ask the question, why did I pick 6535? That's related to your question about fractional banking. I just made it up. You know, I'm just saying this number has to be high enough and I don't know what that number is, but that should tell you. We have spent 100 years trying to fix this, yet we have no idea. You know, all the debate that's going on is whether that five number, remember 95.5? Should that five be seven or not? That's the debate, just so that all of us are clear. All the debate is, oh, five, seven, no, 6.9. Oh, actually, it should be 6.75. I don't know. So what's wrong with 35? No more question. Okay. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Sure. Um, I'm wondering, what is your opinion on counter-cyclical regulations? And do you think that method is being followed through by US regulators? Yeah, so counter-cyclical regulation is this idea that, look, during good times is when we take risks. And bad times, bad stuff happens. And you ask us to go and build buffers and equity and so on. So let's sort of do something on the balance sheet in ways that in good times we build buffer. And in the bad times, we don't have to penalize you that much. Okay? So that's the idea. Now that, again, in principle, sounds like a fantastic idea. Right? But like, what are the problems? Who is going to tell us when bad times have come? Market? But the market you distorted by having so much government regulation. How much are we going to ask you to build? And the biggest problem with that is when times are good, think about going out and telling to people that, oh, you know what? Interest rates should be higher because times are very good. We need to build a buffer for bad times. How's that going to be politically feasible? It's very, very difficult. In principle, a good idea. There are lots of economists. Economists are smart people. They come up with really great stories. But unless you see it in the data and embrace the reality of political economy and all the government frictions, I think it's, we are going to have the same debates again and again and again. So one thing you need to take away from this, since we are concluding, 35%. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Amit.